Well, how do you follow that? I don't even know what to say at this point. And it pretty much uh, covers, covers, runs the gamut there. How are you guys doing this morning? You seem very confused when I asked that question. Was that a difficult question? You guys doing all right this morning? Okay, all right. Well, we'll see how that goes here in just a minute. Welcome back to our sermon series titled House of Cards. And we're in part three this week. And We've been looking at this thing called faith. And more specifically, what we've been looking at is what you're leaning your faith against. And for some of us, the sad truth is we are very close to walking away from our faith. Because where we used to think we had this whole God thing figured out, all of a sudden, something bumped into it in our life. And everything we held on to and everything we depended on, whether that's you know, our faith, our God, whatever that is, was kind of like a house of cards and it fell apart, right? Sound familiar? Now, during this series, we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, and in review, Hebrews is actually a letter uh, written to encourage some of the early followers of Christ who were going through some rough times uh, in that, that part of their life, and they were kind of thinking about stepping away from their faith. They were thinking about quitting this new faith in Jesus Christ. And really, that's because before their decision to follow Jesus, their lives were hard. I mean, it was hard before. And after they started following him, it seemed to get harder for some reason. And so they were a bit frustrated with this going on. And so the takeaway from this book of Hebrews is don't give up and don't quit. All right? That's the same thing we have going on in this series here. You see, the truth is God can do anything, right? I mean, he's God, right? And, and sometimes we'll ask him for something, and he'll say, absolutely, no problem, I'll do that immediately. And we like that answer, don't we? You know, I asked for it at three, and I got it at four. You know, better than UPS. That's awesome. But now sometimes we ask God for something, and he says, yes, but not now. Yes, but not now. Now, I don't like that personally as much, but as long as I know God's on it, God's going to do it, then I can still hang with God. But here's the old dagger to the cardiac muscle. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll say to God, I need this, I want this, please do this for me. And uh, he says, no. He says, no. And then I ask God, do you mean no, not now? And he'll say, no, not ever, not ever. Now, I hate that answer. I don't like that answer at all. I don't know if you guys do, but I don't like that answer personally. So when God says no to our request, it kind of stings a little bit, right? And we're left wondering, God, are you really here for me? God, do you love me? God, do you keep your promises? So with that, when this happens almost organically, another question bubbles to the surface. What is it exactly that God has promised us to do? Now, before we answer that, maybe we should clarify what God has not promised to do. First, and this is on your program, first, God never promised that if you have enough faith that everybody will get healed. No, God didn't say, if you have enough faith, I will keep the cancer away and all the cars in the right lane. He never said that. Second, God never said that if you muster up enough faith, that he would change his mind about something that he wasn't going to do to begin with. Okay? And like, for example, when I pray about God's favorite NFL team, we all know who that is, right? God's favorite NFL team. His retort often goes like this. Keep it down. I'm speaking now. Oh, keep it down. Keep it His retort often goes like this. You know, Eric, my devoted son and lover of the Redskins nation, I know you've been praying that the Skins would win at least one game this year. And though I am the Lord of Lords, and I'm the King of Kings, and you know that I love the Redskins with every morsel of my perfect being, and can do anything, it's probably not going to happen. Because, well, they suck. Okay? <laughs> That's a bummer, right? It is a bummer for us Redskins fans. Also, this may be a shocker to some of you, I don't know, but God never promised that everybody would be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Because if he did promise that, well, then he owes a lot of us in here right now an apology, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially, if you think about it, especially some of the people in the Bible, like, I don't know, Jesus? 
Yeah, yeah, because I think it's fair to say that Jesus had way more faith in God than what we do, and yet he had a really painful life. So beyond forgiveness of sins and the get out of hell free card that he gives us, which are both awesome, what has God promised to do for us today? What has God promised? Okay, so hang on, and I'll get to the answer just in just a little bit. Now, during this series, we've been using Vegas as an example. And you guys all know the, the mantra from Vegas. What is that? What happens in Vegas? Stays. Stays in Vegas. You are a very energetic crowd this morning. I'll tell you what, I just feel it coming back to me right here. Okay. What happens in Vegas? Stays. You can see. Awesome, awesome. So what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, in Vegas, you can do some stuff and you can see some stuff and you can experience some stuff that you can't see, do, or experience anywhere else, right? But in Magic Vegas land, they say you can do all these things with no repercussions. You can come here and do anything you want, and we won't tell. We won't tell, and no one will ever know, right? You see, the operative word here is temptation. And temptation is really just a religious word for that wrestling match that goes on inside our heads where we have two deals on the table and we have to pick one. And the thing about Vegas is all those things you said no to in the past, here you can say yes to them and it won't really matter, right? But what a lot of us have discovered about Vegas and a lot of other areas of our life is that it did matter. It didn't stay there. In fact, it followed us home. And here's the kicker. It not only followed us home, heck, it moved in and picked, up and picked out towels, right? It stayed, and it's not going anywhere in, 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 anytime soon. You see, some of us have made some poor decisions and done some stupid stuff in our past, and we're still living with that today. And the truth is, a lot of the time when this happens, our tendency is to defend these past decisions and say, yes, but I had a very valid reason for doing what I did. Like, it was a special occasion, or I was going through a hard time. I was going through a good time. I was just mad I needed to blow off some steam. Or I was really lonely, and did you see how she looked? Oh my gosh. And I know I shouldn't have done it, but I just needed a break. I deserved a break today, the old McDonald's theology there. And then what happens next is pretty typical, right? We begin to blame everyone else for our mistakes, right? If my wife would have done what she was supposed to do, or my husband, or my friend, or my kids, or my parents, then this would not have happened. And then with all these excuses kind of pyramiding up to the heavens, we begin to throw God under the bus, don't we? Yeah, well, if God would have done what he should have done because I asked him and I begged him and he didn't show up, so this is kind of his fault too. So it's really not my fault if you think about it. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So you see, the same thing is happening, is going on in this book of Hebrews here. People are people, and they're trying to follow God, but they get to the point where things aren't going their way, and they're just worn out. And the truth is, we all do this. We all end up saying things like, Lord, I need your help today, not just after I die. I need it right now. I mean, I've read all the incredible Bible stories, and I believe. I believe that you can heal anybody. I do believe that, and that's awesome. But what about me? What about me right now? I mean, I'm still sick. I mean, I've been praying for some people in my life for years, and they're not getting any better. What's up with that, God? And then we look across the room at people, and we start thinking, God made your, your marriage better. Awesome. Mine is worse than ever. Your family's getting better. Awesome. My kids won't speak to me. You have a job. Good for you. I don't. You have friends. Sweet. I'm all alone. Your kid's in third grade and on the honor roll. Wow. Mine died. You have an addiction and you beat it. I'm still struggling. Your life is getting better and you feel God's love. Mine's getting worse and I feel like God has left the building. Ever feel like that? Yeah. Well, that's temptation. That's temptation right there in our face. 
So you see, if if God doesn't promise that, if He doesn't promise that everyone's going to get, you know, the job of their dreams, the love of their life, that their cancer is going to go away, and that their kids are going to be safe, what does He promise? Now let's take a look at Hebrews here. Hebrews 4:14. 4, this is on your programs too. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, let's pause there just for a second. When we get to that next verse, the, the verse after this, and, and I don't want you to read ahead, stop looking at your programs, look at me, focus right now, all right? When we get to the next verse, I'm of the opinion that this is the hardest verse in the Bible to believe. Think about that for a second. The hardest verse in the Bible to believe. Matter of fact, I would dare say when we read this next verse, most of us, most of us in this room won't believe that it's true. I'm willing to make that bet. I mean, we might nod our heads and go, oh yeah, I believe it's true, Pastor. But then when I turn away, you're going to nudge the person next to you and say, nah, I don't, there's no way that's true, right? You see, I think it might be easier to believe in six literal days of creation. Or that Jesus walked on water and healed all those people and fed all those people. And that Moses actually parted the Red Sea and walked out unscathed than to believe this next Verse. That's how difficult it is to digest. And that's a great build-up, right? So let's go ahead and get to it and read it. This will be on the screens. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And probably a better word there would be empathize. You know, that he's, he's been where we are. Now here's the hard part. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Hold the phone, man. I'm telling you, wait a second there. You mean to tell me that we have a Jesus who has been tempted in every way? Every way that we've been tempted? Really? I mean, are you serious about that? You see, this is saying that Jesus had the same two deals on the table as we have. And he's wrestled with the same choices. He had, he's had the same kinds of people whispering in his ears, you ought to do this or you ought to do that. So he's been tempted in every way that you and I have. So essentially, what this is saying is that we have a me too, Jesus. We have a me too, Jesus. You see, the only difference is when Jesus was tempted, he chose to do the right thing. So he looks at us and goes, I know. I felt it too. I've been there. I bought the t-shirt. So I'm telling you, don't give up. Now, time out again for a minute. If I may be perfectly honest, I I've heard this verse my entire life. I mean, my dad was a deacon in the church. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. Heck, our former pastor that was our next door neighbor and ate fried chicken with us every Sunday after church. So I've heard all this. I I I've heard it. But I have to say, when I hear that Jesus has been tempted in every way that I have, I'm thinking, I, I don't know. I I'm not so sure about that. You mean to tell me that all the stuff that has gone through my mind, gone through my head, all also went through Jesus' head? Because I really can't speak for you, but I've had some pretty jacked up stuff go through my head. I don't know about you, right? I mean, it's scary between my ears sometimes. And the truth is, I've had some stuff dancing between my ears that if God was tuning in that day, he probably would have said, Eric, just go to hell. I mean, I, I, I can't help you. I can't help it. Just go to hell. It would have been followed by a flushing sound from the old heavenly commode, whoosh, as I was swirling the bowl going down, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. So I'm not thinking, if Jesus has felt all the stuff that I do, you guys are awake now, cool. <laughs> if Jesus has felt all the stuff that I have felt, then wow, I mean, that's an incredible story. So if you are like me, and you still find this verse a, a bit suspect, let me unpack this for us a little bit. First, and this is speaking mostly to, to, to men, to, to males, but I think women can relate to this as well. Guys, what is the number one temptation that men struggle with? Just shout it out if you know the answer. Sex, Sex lust, pornography, all that jazz, right? You guys were not shy about that one, were you? Coming back at me. So if you and I have been tempted sexually, you're saying, this is saying, that Jesus has faced that too? Really? Well, the Bible says in Colossians 1 that Jesus created everything. Everything was created by him and through him. So that has to include sex, right? 
You see, for the longest time, I thought that the reason Jesus didn't sin sexually was because he didn't know what he was missing. I mean, I did. Well, obviously, he did know what he was missing. He invented it, right? And the angels were probably like, you know, Jesus, are you sure they'll like that? And Jesus was like, yeah, oh yeah, they'll like it. Yeah, trust me on that one. So, of course, he knows. All I have to do is say sex, you guys are right back in the conversation. Anyway. But then I thought, yeah, but did Jesus have the opportunity? Well, if you read scripture, every other person in the Bible named Mary was a former hooker. So yeah, he had ample opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah, if he wanted to do that. So you see, Jesus had these two deals on the table. I could have sex with her and God wouldn't like it, or I could choose to stay faithful to God and remain inside his will. And he chose to be faithful every single time. Here's another one. It doesn't stop. Here's another one. How about pride? Anyone in here ever played the arrogant card? You know, do you know who I am? Do you know what I have? Do you know what I've done? My dad can beat up your dad? You know what I'm talking about? Of course, that last one is true about Jesus. Every time, his dad could definitely beat up our dad. But yet, yeah, all of us at one time or another have had an overwhelmingly animalistic desire to punch someone right in the face who was acting like an arrogant jerk, right? Every single one of us. Raise your hand if you felt like that. I'm just kidding. Ah, you did anyway, didn't you? Ah. Do you think that ever crossed Jesus' mind? Do you think Jesus ever thought about that? Right? Because it crosses my mind quite often. It does. How about the time when Jesus was kneeling in front of his disciples? He was washing their feet and they were arguing about who was the greatest among them. You know, if I was Jesus in that situation, I would have looked up and said, I am. I'm the greatest. How about when Jesus was arrested and the Roman guard that he created strips him naked publicly and rips all the skin off his back with a cat of nine tails with a whip, spits in his face and says, Hey, king, I think I would look back up him, at him and said, I actually am the king. I am the king. How about when you're nailed to a cross and the people who are, you are dying for are yelling at you, Hey, if you're so great, save yourself. Come down here and then maybe we'll believe in you. Now, if that were me up there, I, I, I would have come off that cross faster than Kim Kardashian changed his boyfriends. And I, <laughs> and I would have began to open a whole new level of whoop ass. I said it. I, I would have done it. I'm just saying, okay? I, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Pray about it. <laughs> How about this one? How about this one? Grief. Grief. Have you ever felt grief? Ever had grief? Ever had uh, your, your heart broken with grief? Well, Jesus did. How about the time when someone ran up to him and said, Hey, Jesus, did you hear what happened to your cousin John the Baptist? They cut off his head and, and, and used it as a halftime show at the king's party. How about when they said, Jesus, your BFF Lazarus has died. And Jesus ran to the funeral, and when he got there, all the family members looked at him and said, It's your fault. It's your fault, Jesus. Have you ever had a family member say the worst sayings at the worst times to you? Ever happened? And so Jesus' response was what? The shortest verse in the Bible. I bet you know this one. What was it? Say it. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now why did Jesus weep? Because his friend died. That's why he did. And then you might say, yeah, but Jesus knew that, you know, he was going to raise him back from the dead. Well, so what? I mean, so what? I have been to funerals before where I knew the person that was there, that I was officiating, I, I knew they were in heaven with Jesus right then. They'd been healed. They weren't suffering anymore. But my heart was still breaking as I cried for that loss, right? Does that make sense? How about you? I mean, uh, just before, uh, about every funeral I've ever done, almost like clockwork when I'm talking with the families, they'll tell me, I know my loved one is in heaven, but all I want right now is for them to walk down those stairs and have breakfast with me one more time. That sound familiar? Yeah. I think we all can relate with that. How about this? Ever had any of your friends stab you in the back, betray you, deny you, act like they didn't know you? Because it happened to Jesus all the time. Ever stayed up all night tossing and turning and sweating and praying because you know tomorrow is going to be the worst day of your life? Jesus did. Ever been so depressed that the way you describe your life is that you were so overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death? 
That's how Jesus described his life. Ever beg God to change your circumstances because they're just so hard that you don't think you can get through it? Jesus did. Ever had God say no? Jesus did that too. You see, Jesus is telling us that I have prayed the same prayer that every one of you will eventually pray. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he says, I get it. I know. I've been there. I've felt it. I've had the same temptation in front of me as you have. And I wanted to quit too. And so the message coming back to us is this. Hold on. I know it's tough. But, you know, I know what you're going through. But I love you so much that I not only died for you so that you could have life, but I've also experienced the things that you are or will be experiencing. So don't quit. Hang in there. Now, if that's true, then check this out. This is Hebrews 4.16. Let us approach the throne of God with grace, a uh, throne of grace with confidence. And here's the promise. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, here's God's promise. He says, you can come to me with anything. Nothing is off limits. You can ask me for anything. And sometimes I'm going to do exactly what you ask me to do, and sometimes I'm not. But every time you come to me, I promise I'll give you mercy. And in this mercy, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I still love you. You will know that. And besides mercy... I will also give you grace. And through this vehicle of grace, I'll give you enough strength to get through what's in front of you. And sometimes it will be more than enough. Sometimes it will be just enough. But it will always be enough strength to get to whatever you're going through. So my promise God is saying is this. I will give you mercy and I will give you grace in all situations. You see, you may be thinking to yourself right now, man, it couldn't get any worse than what's going on in my life. Well, let me tell you something. If you don't know this, it could get worse. It could get a lot worse. You know, the weight you're carrying right now, there's tons more of it out there. There sure is. And it has the potential to crush you. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, if you follow me, I won't let it. You see, the truth is, God is not going to take away the circumstances of your life. He's not going to do that. He's not going to take away the temptation. And here's a newsflash for you, if you didn't know this. God doesn't even promise to take away the consequences of our past Vegas moments. He doesn't do that. You see, it doesn't matter how much faith you have. If you smoke, you still get cancer. Faith has nothing to do with that. You know, yeah, if you sleep with someone, they might get pregnant. If you sleep with the wrong person, it might lead to divorce court or a series of painful shots. If you break the law, gosh, Kevin, I wasn't even going to say that. I can't help myself. So, see, there's God tuning into what I'm saying. If you break the law, you still go to jail. You still go to jail. There, that has nothing to do with faith whatsoever, right? You see, God is not a genie in a bottle where you can just rub his belly and, you know, and, and, and make a wish and he'll bail you out of what you're doing, bail you out of all your mistakes. That's not faith. That's not God. That's a bail bondsman or your mommy, okay? And he never promised that. But what God does promise is that regardless of what you're facing, he'll be there. He'll be there for you every single time. You see, the truth is, Jesus says, you may not always get what you want, but if you believe in me, I promise you, it, I, will be everything you need. Now that's a great promise, right? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, just knowing that a lot of us are going through some rough times right now. A lot of us are in the valley and so far away from the mountain that we can barely even see it. But Lord, you are there in those moments for us, showing us mercy and grace. And though you're not always going to give us exactly what we want, you'll always give us exactly what we need. So, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the sacrifice and, and the empathy you have for us of being there, of having the same experiences that we have, knowing that you are a God who understands us, a God who gets us. 
and a God who will love us to the very end. As long as we reach out to you and follow you and have faith and lean all of that against you. Because when we start leaning against other things, it will fall eventually. It's just a house of cards. It's just a matter of time. So thank you, Lord Jesus. And now as we transition to a time of tithes and, and offerings, I just pray that as we give this morning, it's with a glad heart, that we do so knowing that it will help, help do some wonderful things for this community and beyond. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity today to give back to you because you are a mighty God with a mighty mission and we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.